Tonight I want to speak on a subject that in 44 years of ministry I have never preached on before. I have been aware of it and uh, well aware of it. But as I was preparing to come here and be a part of this healing service tonight, I felt the Lord quicken my spirit and I've sat down in recent hours and put together a message entitled, Seven Ways That Jesus Healed the Sick. How many of you know that Jesus Christ is still our great physician? I'm reading out of Matthew chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 23, reading also verse 24, reading out of the New Living Translation. There the Bible says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Now, if you have a highlighter, I always encourage our students all around the world, anytime you hear me preach or teach, always have a Bible, always have a way of taking notes. Digital or paper makes no difference to me. Just remember this, your mind, even if you have a sharp mind, retains somewhere between 23 and 27 percent of what you hear. Your pen or your pencil has a 100 percent retention rate. And so if you intend on being a serious student of the Bible, you should always take what I call life notes. And with time you will have a collection of biblical wisdom that will change your life. And if the Lord tarries, you can pass it on as a legacy to children that will change their life. And even grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Can I hear a good amen? amen? So highlight that. He healed, Jesus, he healed every kind of disease and illness. I emphasize that because some might ask, well, you know what I have or what I'm battling or what I'm going through? They say it's very rare. They say only one in a million people or one in ten million. Every kind of sickness and disease and illness. Verse 24. News about him spread as far as Syria. And people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease or if they were demon possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. And highlight those words as well. He healed them all. By faith, just raise a hand to Jesus and say, thank you, Lord, for healing me tonight and keeping me well. Father, in the name of Jesus, we never open up the sacred scriptures without a genuine awareness of our total and complete dependence upon you. I humble my heart not only before this audience, both those that are present live and the hundreds and the thousands in the days to come that will watch this through social media. But I humble my heart most importantly before you and ask that by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you would lead and guide us in these moments. I pray that people would be encouraged in their faith and strengthened in their faith to believe God for supernatural health. Your promise to every child of God is with long life, I will satisfy thee. I pray in the name of Jesus, there would be an anointing as I preach to dispense long, satisfying life. I pray for those listening present, those online who may not know Christ. I pray that you would save and deliver and heal. Give people the faith and the courage and the humility when the invitation is given to turn from sin and turn to Christ. And we'll be careful to give you praise for all things, for you alone are worthy. And all God's people said, Amen. As we read the Holy Scriptures, and in the Gospels in particular, study the life of Jesus Christ, we find seven and only seven ways that Jesus Christ healed. 
But with that said, as a proper student of the Scripture, how many of you know that you have to read the entirety of the book and we don't build doctrine from individual texts. We build doctrine from the collective teaching of the totality of the Bible. And so as we read the entirety of Scripture, we make the allowance that because the Scripture tells us that volumes couldn't contain everything that Jesus did, there perhaps is the possibility that He healed through other methodologies. But God, who is the author of all Scripture inspired, only showed us seven in the Bibles that we hold in our head. John chapter 21 and verse 25. The Bible said Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. But the good news for us today is that just as Jesus healed then, Jesus healed now. Now if you listen to some more liberal theologians, Bible believing, evangelicals, who will tell you that healing was for then, but healing is not for now. I would strongly disagree. Because Jesus upon the cross not only shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, he took stripes upon his back for the healing of our physical bodies. And if salvation is available today, then healing is available today. Can I hear a good Pennsylvania amen? amen. Jesus Christ is still in the healing ministry in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And of course the book of Hebrews in the 13th chapter. And the 8th verse tells us. Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today and forever. If you're taking notes. Here are the 7 ways that Jesus healed in his earthly ministry. Which translates that Jesus still heals in these same methods Today, number one, Jesus healed by a word of instruction. When we study the life of Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus simply at times spoke a word or gave instructions and those who heard those instructions and obeyed those instructions received their healing. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through verses 14. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Jesus didn't pray for them. Jesus didn't anoint them. Jesus didn't lay hands upon them. Jesus didn't have the disciples gather in a prayer chain. Jesus simply gave a simplistic word of instruction. Go show yourselves to the priests. And in obedience to the command and to the instruction, healing was released in their lives. Don't miss what I'm about to say. I believe many times people do not walk in the fullness of the health God intended because we don't pay attention to the still small voice of God and the instructions that he'll often give to us. Now I have never heard the audible voice of God. I am quick to tell people that. Because when I grew up in church. It seemed like everybody in their neighbor was constantly saying. You know on the way to work today. The Lord spoke to me. And I heard stuff like that thousands of times. And by the time I was about 11 or 12. 
I was starting to think that God was ticked off with me because he wasn't saying boo to me. And I was praying and reading my Bible and trying to live a Christian life. And with maturity, I learned that a lot of people frivolously say God spoke to me. Now, I do believe that God speaks. The Bible said, my sheep know my voice. But in my 44 years of ministry, through praying and fasting and seeking out the supernatural, I have operated in all nine of the gifts of the Spirit, but never once have I heard an audible voice. But in my spirit, I can recognize the voice of God. I can recognize the prodding of God. I can recognize the pushing of God. I oftentimes tell people we need to pay more attention to the fingerprints of God. Too many people are wanting to hear an audible voice. But I'm here to tell you to those who walk in the Spirit and to those who live by the commandments of the Scriptures, you will oftentimes see the fingerprint of God in your life making Himself known. He'll stop an entire plane of hundreds of people and delay it just so his child can get on the plane and go preach the gospel. I watch for the fingerprints of God. Because if you'll listen, God will speak. The problem is most of us have the volume knob of the world turned up too high. It's not that God doesn't speak and direct and give instruction. But the Bible said he speaks in a still small voice. But most of us have created a world that we live in where the volume knob is on 8 or 9 and sometimes 10. And it's not that God's not wanting to speak and to guide and to direct But he's speaking at level one and two and he's being drowned out by all of the carnality that you've allowed into your sphere of influence. I'm here to tell you if you want to walk in the supernatural power of God, there is a price to be paid for the supernatural. And one of the price tags in the supernatural realm of God is you've got to learn to identify the volume knob of this carnal world and the volume knob of your heavenly Father and make a practice to turn the world down or better yet, turn it off and turn on the things of the Spirit and let the power of God lead you and guide you into miracle power. I've always preached my entire ministry that healing's cooperative. You can't sit in a lazy bore recliner at the end of the day and read your Bible and eat half a gallon of Haagen-Dazs and wonder why you're having joint pains. Sometimes we just need to make better decisions. Can I hear amen? Amen. Now I'm going to flip that coin over and give you the exact antithesis. Some Christians, knowingly or unknowingly, think they're their healer. Well, you know, every morning I get up and I have this blender that makes juice and I put lemongrass in it, dandelions, moose lips, hog brains, gopher toes, and I make this beautiful little shake. And since I've been drinking that new shake that I discovered on YouTube, I'm feeling better every day. You better be careful how you talk. If you think you're in charge of your own health, there's a limitation to that. Because healthy people die all the time prematurely. As a child of God, you'd better be quick to say, Father God, you're my healer. Father God, you're my source. Now, I don't have any problem with eating healthy. Just don't put that stuff in a blender and ask me to come to your house. If you want to eat that way, that's between you and the Lord. Some of you need to get delivered from some of the stuff you're trusting in. 
You spend more time studying pills and medications and vitamins and supplements and recipes. And again, thank God for however you want to live life. But as a believer, you not, never cross that line where you think you have more power over your health than God does. Because God is still the healer. And many times sickness has nothing to do with nutrition if it's a demonic attack against your body. Demons don't respond to lemongrass. <laughs> Demons don't respond to B vitamins. And so on. And sometimes I'm around Christians that spend more time talking about Dr. Oz than they do Dr. Jesus. I came to tell you, I believe in Dr. Jesus. I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost that will heal you and keep you and sustain you. Come on and shout a mighty praise to God. Hallelujah. But if you'll listen, God will speak to you about your health. One of my Bible students from around the world wrote me just the other day and said, Tiff, what is gluttony in the Bible? And I gave him a brief answer about controlling the flesh. And people that are dominated by appetites they have no controls of. And it's not just food. It, it equally speaks of drink. Food and drink and gluttony. And the Bible says a glutton puts a knife to his own throat. How many of you know that's in the Bible? God can speak to you. Listen carefully. God didn't call everybody to be bone thin. But God did call everybody to be healthy. And I'm here to tell you that there are practical things in healing. Why don't you pray and say, God, what's an ideal weight range for me to stay in? Give me the disciplines to get there. God, what exercises might I do? Instead of kneeling and praying, some of you'd be a whole lot better walking and praying. And if you'll listen to the voice of God, He'll speak to you about harmful habits. He'll speak to you about how you can recover health that you've lost. He'll speak to you about poor choices. And He'll give you wise choices. Don't ever forget, healing is cooperative. You have to pay attention to the voice of God. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Number two, Jesus healed by the laying on of hands. We often see Jesus in the gospel healing the sick and the diseased by the act of laying his hands upon them or touching them. Matthew chapter 20 verses 29 through 34. As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them. But they only shouted louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, What do you want me to do for you? Praise God. Praise God. Highlight that in your Bible. That's the kind of Jesus that we find in the scripture. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus cares about you. Jesus understands you. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to work his miracle power in you. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see. Now that's one of the best healing prayers in the Bible and it's four words in duration. We want to see. A thousand word prayers don't increase your odds of healing. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ defined in simplest terms is oftentimes the way for heaven to touch you and for you to touch heaven. 
Lord, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes and instantly they could see. Then they followed him. Throughout the scriptures, Jesus healed people simply by his touch. Now for Jesus to touch somebody in the Bible, the average length of a man's arm or a woman's arm is around 30 inches, some a little more, some a little less, based on size. But what it translates to is that for Jesus to touch them, they had to be within about three feet. Now my point I want to make in that simple illustration of length is the closer you get to Jesus, the better your life will get. The closer you get to Jesus, the better your life will become. A lot of people don't want to get close to Jesus. They're afraid to get close to Jesus. They wonder, will Jesus rebuke me? Will Jesus judge me? Will Jesus see the things I've done? Let me tell you something. Jesus is a wonderful Savior. And He is rich in mercy and rich in grace to those who come into His presence with humility and with prayer. Don't ever be afraid of the touch of Jesus. Don't ever be afraid of the move of God. Don't ever be afraid of the presence of the Most High God. Because the closer you can get to Him, the more miraculous the things will take place in your life. And He still is the same today. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. I love that verse in James 4, verses 7 and 8. Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God. And God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let me break that down in straightforward 21st century English. You cannot draw close to God and at the same time draw close to the world. If you're going to draw close to God, you must first resist the devil and the work of the devil and the children of the devil and the friends of the devil and the language of the devil and the humor of the devil and the entertainment of the devil. Resist The things of the devil. That's how you start drawing close to God. You have to take one hand and say devil goodbye. And take the other hand and say Jesus hello. Hallelujah. That's what salvation is. Salvation is the day you say sin and devil goodbye. And Jesus I repent and receive and say hello. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a mighty shout of praise. Matthew 14, 35 and 36, when the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area and soon people were bringing all their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. I don't have time to preach it tonight, but I have a message entitled The Proximity Factor that basically emphasizes the closer you can fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the proximity of being in his presence, the proximity of being close enough to touch, The proximity of being close enough to feel and to communicate and to hear and to obey. It launches your life into a different trajectory. And God begins to accelerate the forward and upward progress of whatever he's called you to do. The closer you get to Jesus, the faster you will excel in the will and the work of God. Can you say praise his name? Number three, Jesus healed through his virtue. Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 46. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, 
Here's this proximity factor again. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. Highlight that in your Bible. That's solid gold. Someone deliberately touched me. You know, a lot of people think that touching Jesus is random and you play no part. That Jesus moves and like the wind, whether whoever he desires, and he touches some and bypasses others. But here we learn that you can make a plan to deliberately touch Jesus. For I felt healing power go out from me. In the King James Version it said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Virtue is a word we don't use much in the 21st century. But let me give you a snapshot biblical gold nugget on virtue. Virtue is always positive. It's different than power. Because power can be a force for good or for evil. But virtue in the Greek is different. And it is always positive. Virtue speaks of the moral excellence the righteousness and the uprightness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the walking embodiment of holy virtue. Number four, Jesus healed through the gifts of healing. Turn to John chapter 5 verses 1 through 9. John chapter 5 verses 1 through 9. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well, there it is again. Earlier we read, what would you like for me to do? With this miracle, would you like to get well? Verse 7, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Pause again. Obviously, this man had little to no faith, little to no expectation, little to no teaching, little to no awareness as to who he was talking to. You can't find anything in the response of that man that rings out faith or expectation. But the Bible goes on to say in verse 8, Jesus told him, stand up. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. During the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he operated without limit in all nine of the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus was operating here in the purity of the gift of healing. It's one of the classic biblical examples of the gift. No faith on the man's part. No expectation on the man's part. No understanding on the man's part. But the gift of healing, the anointing that rests in that, can cause miracles where people don't even believe in miracles. Can cause a release 
of power where people rebel against the power of God. Jesus didn't lay hands on the man. He didn't anoint him with oil. He did not prevail in prayer. The man that was healed didn't exhibit anything worthy of faith. Jesus simply operated in the gift of healing as he desired to do as the sinless, limitless son of the holy God. Can I hear a big praise God? Man, I'd like to peel that onion a few layers, but for time's sake, I won't. But I'll tell you that this is how the gifts of healing operate. The manifestation of the gift of healing operates as the Spirit wills, not by the will of men. I've preached in crusades, large and small, in over 50 countries of the world. And I have seen the gift of healing operate, and you wonder how. God would even respond in areas where the gospel is devoid. I preached in a remote village in the Arctic Circle. Before arriving there, my research uncovered that nobody had been there in 104 years, which translates that no one in that village had ever heard the name of Jesus. No one in that village had even seen a Bible. I would stop and ask, They were all Yupik, and we oftentimes refer to people that live in the Arctic Circle as Eskimos. That'll get you in trouble if you ever go to the villages in the Arctic Circle because they have heritage and pride, and there's Yupik people, and there's Inuit people, and there's Yupiet people, and there's Aluet people, and various tribes. But in that village, I stopped as many as I could stop, and I would show them my Bible, And say, have you ever seen or heard of this book called the Bible? Never one time did anybody respond having any idea as to what it was. A group of kids were standing around me as I was tuning up my guitar. Not too many people fly to the Arctic Circle to sing and to preach. And I was probably the only white man they had ever seen. And they were gathered around me with their silky dark hair. And their skin, a special color reserved only for people who live in 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, below zero. A rugged group of people. But those kids were gathered around watching me tune my guitar. I heard one of the girls turn to one of her girlfriends and say, Look at his eyes. They're green like a monster. (laughs) That empowered one of the younger boys to ask his question. He said, Mister, what's wrong with your hair? (laughs) He had never seen red hair. And the older I get, it's becoming lighter and blonde and white. And uh, to be honest with you, I could care what color it is. I'm just happy to have it. (laughs) But even as I share the story, I feel it in the pit of my spirit. Preaching the gospel... To people who had never heard it. I remember as a large crowd of kids were gathering when I was tuning up and getting ready for an evening service. No churches. Just meeting in the open building there that they had in the village. Permission given by the tribal elder. And as I was tuning up and singing and trying to get just the sound check ready. The kids just gathered around in swarms. And I paused for a moment and I said... Has anybody here ever heard of Jesus? And one of the kids said so innocently, Is he going to fly in on a plane like you did? Just thought it was another white man. Maybe coming in a bush plane to that remote village. But I am here to tell you it doesn't matter with Jesus. The gift of healing doesn't need cooperation. The gift of healing doesn't need somebody's faith. The gift of healing doesn't need a popular response. The gift of healing operates by the will of the Spirit just because God is good. Just because God wants to demonstrate His power and His glory. Just because God delights in showing His Son Jesus to be the only begotten of heaven. That is how the gifts 
of healing operate. The Apostle Paul operated in the gift of healing. Listed it as one of the nine gifts to the church. He said in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else. The one Spirit gives the gift of healing. Number five, Jesus healed through unorthodox methods. Quite striking. And there are more than one example in the Bible, but for the sake of time, I give you one. We see it in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. There the scripture says, when they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch the man and to heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and asked, Can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. And his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored. And he could see everything clearly. Let me pause long enough to say that if Jesus had to pray on an occasion twice, you may have to pray and believe the Lord more than once. The Bible says, knock and keep on knocking. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Once you find something in the Bible that is revealed to be the will of God, you have every right through the shed blood of Jesus Christ to put a bulldog grip on it and say, I'll not let go until I receive what God has promised to me. Come on and shout, Jesus is still our healer. I'm sure that would not be anybody's preferred way of being healed. But Jesus healed in unorthodox ways. I remember an unorthodox healing that took place in a large open air crusade in South America. A soccer stadium, 25, 35,000 people. And on the opening night, I remember preaching the gospel clearly, giving the invitation and I specifically remember in excess of 1,200 people were saved that night, first time decisions for Christ. And uh, the reason I remember that in many of our overseas crusades, our decision cards are in triplicate, but they're numbered. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, so on. And I remember that night, the last card was 1,200 and something. Over 1,200 people had responded to the gospel to receive Jesus Christ. And in our foreign crusades, in those lost lamb events, I always, after I give the invitation, I always pray for the sick. And as I stood on that platform, and we had already led people in response to faith in Christ and repentance, I said, the same Jesus who forgives our sins heals our bodies. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to believe that whatever you need in your body, Jesus is present tonight to heal. And I begin to pray. You know, when crowds are, are that large, it really is almost impossible physically. If you've never been in large crusades or poured out of your spirit, you couldn't imagine laying hands on thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. You'd be there through the night and probably into the next day. But I've learned what most massive evangelistic crusades have learned. That I'm not the healer. That Jesus is the healer. And you can release the gift of healing corporately. And so I began to pray by the leading of the Spirit and begin to address things by the leading of the Spirit. And particular diseases and sicknesses and illnesses. And I remember cursing cancer in the name of Jesus. I curse it tonight in the name of Jesus. 
everyone within the sound of my voice, diagnosed with cancer, any tumor, any unnatural growth, I curse it in the name of Jesus. I command it to die and to shrivel up. I command it to leave your body in the mighty name of Jesus. I release the fire of God that heals from the top of your head to the soles of your feet to the tips of your fingers. Be healed. Be set free in Jesus' name. And as I was praying that night, I didn't realize it. But there was a lady, she was one of the 1,200 plus that had given her heart to Christ. I found out the next day that she had just been sent home by her doctor that afternoon. She had tumors throughout her body. I'll not describe every part of her body, but when I say her body was filled with tumors, all of her body, female organs, stomach, breast, brain, lungs. If I remember the story right, I believe she had 11 kilos of tumors in her body. And her doctor had sent her home and given her strong medicines And told her there was nothing more that could be done. Enjoy the last days if you're able. With your husband and your children. And somebody invited her to that crusade. I'm talking about God doing unorthodox things. She was so filled with cancer. That the altar worker who had led her to Christ. And was praying for her as I was praying corporately. Thought she was pregnant and ready to deliver, swollen, full of cancer. And the altar worker, not knowing any different. By the way, here's a tip. Never assume a woman is expecting. (laughs) Sooner or later, that will snake bite you seven different ways. Trust me. That lady at the altar worker had her hand on that woman, what she thought was her womb. And by her own testimony, she said, I was praying for the baby. Lord, I ask you to give this woman a healthy baby. The lady must have thought the woman praying for was insane. She's got days to live, and this lady's praying for her tumors and calling it a baby. As I said, I curse every unnatural growth in the name of Jesus, command it to die, shrivel up, and leave bodies now. The shirt that she was wearing that was stretched out as if she were an expectant mother fell flat, and she screamed to the top of her lungs, and even in a soccer stadium, I heard the scream. And not just her scream, the scream of the woman praying for the baby. Because she thought the baby had dropped out as she was praying. True story. And by her own admission, was looking in the crowd on the ground to see where the baby had gone. But there was no baby. What left that body was not a little boy or a little girl. But what instantaneously left that body was 11 kilos of cancer instantaneously by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. God may not always heal in your preferred way of doing it, but however God gets the job done, can you say it's all right by me? I gave the media team a picture. If you have it, show it. Because they told me this story the next day. And they said, we need to bring this woman up onto the platform and have her give her testimony. I said, no, we're not going to do that. They said, why? It's an incredible miracle. I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do that's going to be better. We're going to have her doctor come with the reports and the paperwork. And we're going to have the doctor verify it. And those arrangements were made. And the doctor was willing to come to the stage. And they hate to use the word miracle. But as it was translated from their language, 
through my interpreter to my ear, the doctor said, I have no other word to describe what I have verified other than it must be a miracle. And that's the woman holding her report and a clean bill of health one year after the crusade when I returned. Still saved, still healed, still cancer free, still living to testify of the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number six, Jesus healed through empowering his disciples. Mark chapter 6, verses 6 through 13. Then Jesus went from village to village, teaching the people. And he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Jesus has the ability, as he did then, to empower other people to carry on the ministry of divine healing. Lastly, I close with this number seven. Jesus healed through recognizing personal faith. Turn to Matthew chapter eight for this incredible story. Matthew's gospel, the eighth chapter, verses five through 13. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him. Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers. And I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come. And they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At the feast in the kingdom of heaven, but many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because you believed. Highlight that. Because you believed, it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. We need a resurgence of preaching and teaching in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That empowers believers to understand. That there is a place in your relationship with God. Not only to get you healed. But to keep you healed. You don't have to get on a plane. And fly a thousand miles to a healing crusade to get healed. You can get healed by your own faith. Now let me cut one layer deep in that onion for you. People always say you don't need to go see a faith healer to get healed. You can get healed right here. Well the grandiose question 
is our people getting healed right here? Because I've heard pastors and churches preach that and say that, but nobody's been healed in that church since Noah got off the boat. And if nobody's getting healed in that church, feel free to get on a plane and fly to a healing ministry and get healed. But I'm talking about something that's a higher level. And that higher level is to develop in your faith and in your walk with God. Your own personal anointing. That when bacteria and disease and infirmity touches your body, it shrivels up and dies because of the glory of God that rests upon you. Just as it did on the back of missionary John G. Lake's hand in South Africa as he prayed and ministered with people that were dying of the plague. He never, in a highly contagious plague, never got sick. They sent people from Johannesburg Medical Associations and hospitals to try to figure out what's he eating. What type of tea is he drinking? There must be something in the area that he lives that cures this plague. But when they interviewed John G. Lake, he told them it has nothing to do with my diet or my nutrition. He said there is a power in the Lord Jesus Christ that can be attained that when sickness touches your body, the power of Jesus the healer overwhelms it, kills it, destroys it, removes it. I walked through all of these weeks and months of COVID. I never had one ounce of fear. I never had one ounce of dread. By the grace of God to him, I alone give the glory. I never contracted COVID. I never had a fever. I laid hands on thousands. I hugged thousands. I kept on preaching like I always preach. The last time I was here, on a Sunday morning, a woman asked me, will you pray for me? I said, I'd be happy to pray for you. What do you want me to pray about? As she's holding my hand and talking three inches from my nose, she said, I was just diagnosed with COVID this morning and I'd like for you to pray. In my mind, I thought, first I'm going to pray for your IQ then I'm going to pray for your COVID. As she spoke and coughed and spittled in my face, I was just diagnosed with COVID this morning. But I laughed at it because I thought it'll touch my body and die in the name of Jesus and to the glory of God. This old man never had COVID, never will have it. I'm not bragging on me, I'm bragging on Jesus. You see, I had to learn in traveling all around the world and being exposed. I've laid hands upon actual lepers and leposoriums in various places of the world. I've laid hands upon people with highly contagious diseases. And when I say I want to humble my heart and give glory to God, I repeat it, if not the second or the third time, I'm giving glory to the Lord. I take no credit for it. But I am here to tell you there is a personal anointing. There is a personal anointing that you can develop by getting into the Bible, reading the Bible, and one of the greatest keys to this price of supernatural power is you make a vow to God that what comes out of your mouth will never betray what's in that Bible. You're done saying heart disease runs in our family. You're done saying 
cancer runs in our family. You're done saying that people in our family die prematurely quite often. You're done saying that mental problems, cognitive problems, dementia runs in our family. Your family is Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed and no disease runs in the family of Jesus. And in 44 years of preaching in 56 countries of the world, most all of them third world countries. I've averaged preaching probably two to 300 times a year for 44 years. I've never missed one single service. I've never canceled one single meeting. I've never had to say I can't sing because I'm hoarse. Because even when I'm not hoarse, I can't sing. I just put my shoulders down like a halfback and pick up the Bible like a football and look for the first person to run over. There is an anointing in God that doesn't back up. There is an anointing in God that doesn't retreat. There is an anointing in God that fixates upon the impossible and speaks what the Bible says over your life. Make a vow. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. 44 years of traveling the world and never missed a service. That's not normal. That's not natural. I don't have any recipe for lemongrass greeny shakes for your breakfast. I'm here to tell you that I speak the word of God over my life. Almost every day, the first words out of my mouth when I rise in the morning. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you that with long life you satisfy me. Thank you that you go before me. Thank you that I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed coming in. You are my protector and I praise your holy name. That's not normal. That's supernatural. And I can only point my hand toward heaven and say I give all praise and honor and glory to God who has supernaturally sustained my life. Now I'm being honest with you. I've looked death square in the eyes. The enemy has tried to take my life more than once. I am well aware of the fact that when heaven lifts you up in ministry and in divine callings, that hell simultaneously lifts you up as a target. But I'm made out of a different stock. And our family is not runners. We're chasers. I'm not worried about demons and devils. I did a crusade overseas and when I got there, they said, we need to take three days and Fast and pray as to how to handle all of the demonic manifestations. We've never had a crusade in this soccer stadium before. We can't imagine how many hundreds of demonic manifestations we'll have in a crowd this size. I said, I know exactly how many we'll have. Zero. Because I didn't come here looking for demons. I came here looking for souls. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do what I do in all of my crusades. Order several cases of olive oil. And the day before the crusade starts, we're going to meet on this ground. And every man of God and every woman of God is going to get a bottle of oil. And you're going to walk around the perimeter of this stadium sprinkling oil. And here's what you're going to pray. I thank you, Father, that no demon can cross the line of this anointing oil. And I thank you, Father, that no sinner who crosses this line can cross back over it until they're saved. 
And in that crusade, not one single demonic manifestation. And not only that, it was controlled. That area was controlled by a drug cartel. There were seven murders of young men under the ages of 19. The days before the crusade started. The day before we anointed the grounds with oil. Just behind the stage. I watched them put a 17 year old boy in a body bag. And drag him to a truck. Killed in gang violence. There were all kinds of warnings about this and that in the meeting. But I don't go into those meetings afraid of anything. Because Jesus Christ and the angels of heaven are greater. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. And wherever you go, hear me, wherever you go, the devil is not in charge. The children of God are in charge. Act like it. Talk like it. Walk like it. Carry yourself in the authority of the Most High. You are a child, a son, a daughter of the Most High God. And no weapon formed against you can prosper. The first night of that crusade, the gang leader got saved. The second night, people couldn't believe it. Word got out through the gang. You know, that's an expensive commitment for a gang leader to give his heart to Jesus. But the hitman, I found this afterwards, the hitman for that gang, 17 years old, I was told they estimate he had killed between 50 and 100 people before his 17th birthday. The day that I was walking around that stadium, as I got to the far left side of the stadium, there was a large shady tree. And in my spirit, I felt the prodding of the Holy Ghost walk around that tree. And so I got off course of what everybody else was doing with the olive oil and the anointing oil. And I walked out around that tree, shaking that oil. And I said, Father, whoever this week thinks they're going to hide under this tree and listen to the gospel, whoever crosses this line of anointing oil, can't go home until they get saved. Little did I know I was prophesying and not praying. Because that 17-year-old hitman snuck out that night, hid under the limbs of that tree, outside of that stadium, and listened to my voice booming through those speakers, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't know he was there. I specifically remember him telling me face to face, who told you about me? Because I met him after he was saved. Who told you about me? I said, son, through the interpreter, I don't know you from a hole in the ground, but God knows everything. From the day you were born to this day, he knows everything. He said, but you said, even if you're the worst sinner in Pavas, no matter what your sin, no matter what your past, the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ will not only forgive you, but make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. He said, who told you I was the worst sinner in Pavos? And he was hiding under that tree. Again that night, thousands responded to the gospel. Everybody was gone. It was late, probably. I think we had a contract that we were supposed to have the sound off by 9 p.m., it was probably 10, 10.30. And there were just a group of pastors. There were 125 pastors involved in that crusade in churches. And one of them came in and told the story of that young man getting saved. He said, Tiff, he said he didn't come into the crusade because he was afraid of retaliation. Because there were people in that crusade that he had murdered their family, brothers, sisters. He lives in seclusion but he was hiding he said you probably didn't notice it but there's a big tree with a canopy out behind the soccer stadium so, is, that, is that so he was hiding under that tree listening to you preach and when you said even if you're the worst sinner in Pavas God still loves you will save you forgive you and set you free 
He said, I was walking home. And as I went by that tree, I heard a soft cry. And I walked over to the tree, and it was a young man. He said, when I looked him in the eye and realized who it was, I was a little fearful because I knew who he was. Everybody knew who he is. I said, what are you doing here? He said, tonight for the first time in my life, I know there's a God. I felt his presence and I felt his love. And I don't know why, but I can't leave this tree. I don't know why, but I can't leave this tree. I'll tell you why that boy couldn't leave the tree. Because I sprinkled anointing oil around it and took the authority of Jesus' name and said, not one sinner who crosses this line of oil. Unsaved goes back across it. Unsaved in the name of Jesus. The Lord hears and answers prayers. That boy not only got saved, he turned himself in. His pastor counseled him against it and said, it's almost an act of suicide. Are you sure you're going to do this? You see, the night that I met that boy, they brought him to me. As I was walking into the room, they had two bodyguards to go with me. I said, you guys stay outside. Well, you know who this is? I said, I'm not worried about who he is. Well, you know, you just, maybe for precaution. You know, people don't realize the authority that you have in the Lord. The boy should have had the bodyguards. Do I look like I need help taking care of myself? As I walked into that room, I felt the voice of the Holy Spirit say, take your tie off, put it around his neck, and anoint him to be an evangelist. I took my tie off, walked right up to him, when I put it around his neck, he collapsed to the floor and sobbed uncontrollably. And I had the interpreter with me. I laid hands on that boy and prophesied that God had set him apart, saved him from sin, and would use him as an evangelist. So when his pastor said, are you sure you're going to turn yourself in? He said, I've been reading my Bible every day. And one of the first stories I read was a man named Paul who went to prison. And he preached the gospel there. The first day he was put in prison. They beat that boy to death. At least they thought they did. The guards turned their heads. And a group of people in that prison who... He had probably murdered family, cousin, whatever. They beat him until they thought he was dead. They took him to the clinic. Still had a pulse. They moved him to a different prison where they thought he wouldn't be known. And the last I heard, he has a church in that prison of over 400 prisoners that he's led to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a power in God that can put a faith in your spirit where you don't need an entourage of people to lay hands on you. You can just rise up in the power of Christ and the anointing that rests upon Him potentially rests in you. I close with this. Look at Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 11. There the Bible said, You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ. Living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin. The Spirit gives you life. Because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Through the death, 
the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I not only have power over sin, but we have power over sickness, disease, and infirmity. And I came to put an exclamation point upon this fact. Jesus Christ is still the same. The same seven ways he healed in the New Testament are available to every believer today. And though some may say that healing passed away with the death of the last apostle, I came to tell you Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus Christ is still the great healer. Jesus Christ is still the great healer. Every sickness within the sound of my voice, Jesus Christ is still the great healer and no weapon formed against his children shall prosper in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe it and you receive it, stand and give the Lord a mighty hand of praise and thank him for his healing power. Jesus Christ is the same today as he was when he walked on this earth and carried out his ministry. And today we've examined the scriptures and shown you seven ways that God heals. And now I want to conclude by praying for you the first prayer that many of you need to pray is you need to come to Christ. You're not the son of God. You're not the daughter of God. The Bible said either your father is God or your father is the devil. And the Bible said that the power of sin and Satan comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said in John chapter 10, I came that you might have life. Jesus is the master of life. And if you want to walk in the life and the forgiveness and have that relationship with God the Father that you don't have, you can begin that today. I'm going to pray first for those who need to be saved and delivered. And then I'm going to pray for those that need to be healed. But if you need to make peace with God, whether it's your first time or you're away from God and coming back home, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me that many people call a sinner's prayer. When we're done, I want you to go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and follow the prompts. Uh, this ministry exists to help you not only to come to right relationship with God, but to begin to establish a relationship with God. And so when we're done praying, go to lostlamb.org, click on New Beginnings, and follow the prompts. Then you need to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on New Beginnings there. And there are several teachings, just like we did today, that are there for you as a new believer because I really care about you and so does the Lord. If you're needing to come home to Him, pray this with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, Today I recognize my sin and I repent. In childlike faith I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I receive Him as my Lord and as my Savior even now. By Your grace and by Your mercy, forgive me, cleanse me, come into my heart. I acknowledge salvation today, and I receive it full and free in Jesus' mighty name. Now, those of you who need a touch in your body, why don't you, wherever you're at, just lay your hand on whatever part of your body needs a touch, and let's agree together for the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ to release signs and wonders and miracles through the mighty preaching and teaching of His holy and powerful Word. And when you receive a healing or a miracle or God gives you a sign or a wonder, I want you to write and testify and we'll share that with someone. It'll be of great encouragement to them. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I curse every sickness, every disease, every spirit of infirmity within the sound of my voice. I curse cancer. I curse every unnatural growth, 
every tumor. I command them to shrivel up and die and pass from their bodies. I pray that you would open up deaf ears. I pray that you would open up blinded eyes. I pray, Father, that you would restore everything the devil has stolen from people's health. And I pray that through the blood of Jesus Christ, that you would heal them now. I release the fire of God that heals into those who need it most even now. And we give you praise and honor and glory for you are indeed Christ the healer. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.